And so when we talk about lived religion within Hinduism, there's a lot of things that we could talk about because Hinduism is an extremely diverse tradition with a variety of philosophies, rituals, practices. So in this short uh, lecture, we're not actually going to be able to talk about all of it. So instead, what I'd like to focus in on uh, is really the, re the ritual relationship between the devotee and the divine, whatever deity it is. So what we'll do today is I want to focus on the practice of puja, which you could translate as worship. And we can look at this in a lot of different ways, but specifically I want to look at the things that uh, Hindus typically do every day. And we'll be focusing on uh, how they practice in India. So we'll begin with a discussion of temple worship, about the, the what it's like to go to temple and the things that the devotees experience. And once we've discussed temple, going to temple and temple worship a little bit, then I want to focus on the practice of puja, which is this multi-sensory experience with ritual uh, that links the divine and the devotee, uh, generally through an image uh, which you could, which is called murti or vigraha in Sanskrit, and those continue on in, in modern Indic languages. And so this relationship is done through rituals between the devotee looking at an image of the, of the divine. And this looking, this aspect of darshan will be key to this. Uh, so darshan you could translate as sight, so we'll be discussing that a little bit more. And with, along with the site, uh, there are other practices that we'll talk about, uh, like the waving of lamps and arati, um, or the exchange of, of blessings uh, through prasad. So when you go to a, a temple in India, it might be different than what a lot of people uh, are used to uh, from the states. So typically, um, a lot of us think of going to a sacred space as something that is extremely solemn and requires solitude and silence. But when you go to a temple, a Hindu temple in India, uh, it's full of color, it's loud, full of people. Uh, you see deities in procession with loud music and bells uh, ringing. Uh, lots of different smells from the burning of incense and, and camphor. So the experience is something that's extremely vibrant and dynamic. And this vibrancy, uh, I think, does well to encapsulate the tradition itself to where uh, it's a tradition of, you might say, like celebration, uh, to where it's something to where you go to and there's, it should be full of life. Uh, and really the extension of the sort of everyday world goes into into the temple in which it's a, it's a moment of of course it can be about a quiet reflection but it's really it's about the experience uh, that the temple has to offer so whenever you go into the temple uh, and most of the time you don't actually say i'm going to to temple uh, but typically you'll say i'm going to take darshan Darshan is a, a, a modern Indic term from the Sanskrit darshana, which could be translated simply as sight. So core to the idea of going to a temple is that you're going to see the deity. And this deity will be in some form depending on how large or small the temple or shrine is. Uh, often it will be a stone image in the, the main center of the temple. Uh, sometimes you'll go to subsidiary shrines and the, the image may be made of some form of metal like uh, bronze. Uh, or it may be uh, simply just a poster or a painting of the, of the deity. But there will be some sort of representation of the deity within most Hindu temples. And this representation of the deity is called a, a murti um, in Sanskrit or vigraha. And those same terms uh, follow into most modern Indic languages. So as you enter into the temple, the primary goal then is to see this representation of the deity. So I say representation of the deity, but in classical Hindu text, uh, there's actually uh, a direct link between the deity and these images. And so when they were the creative, they would go through this process in which the artists were um, forming them based on rituals, give it certain parameters of the text, uh, making it out of some sort of natural um, product. But eventually when you got to the end, there's a special ceremony in which the deity is asked to come and dwell inside this image. And what's interesting for our purposes talking about darshan is that this is actually the moment to where the eyes are painted on. So when the eyes come to the deity, now all of a sudden the, the god is seen to dwell in that image. So when you go to the, the temple, you want to see that deity um, 
in its representation dwelling there. And so at that moment, you actually have that ability for the, the devotee to look directly into the eyes of the, of the deity and ex share that exchange that only comes through sight. And of course, the sight isn't just coming through uh, the natural eyes, uh, but it's also coming with the third eye. Uh, so if you may have noticed with uh, certain Hindu practitioners after they've been to temple or after they've done any form of puja, that there'll be a, a red mark on their forehead with this um, powder called kumkum. Now, this is to symbolize that this uh, devotee looked at the deity and the deity looked back and they shared an exchange, not just with their um, physical eyes, but also through this third eye uh, with this, this spiritual eye to where they could have this exchange of darshana. So uh, also along with this concept of darshana, there's the, the ritual that accompanies it, which is called puja. A puja can be done on a lot of different scales from large temples to someone's home shrine. And along with these different scales and different spaces, uh, there's different rituals that are gonna be done uh, with different degrees of difficulty. So if you're in a temple, uh, there's a high degree of difficulty in which you have someone who's trained in um, these different texts called um, agamas or tantras, in which it explains the proper way of doing these very elaborate rituals. And so to do a puja within a temple setting, it requires a lot of things like uh, drawing geometrical designs on the floor, uh, having pots, flowers, coconuts, incense, uh, doing certain hand gestures, uh, pouring certain things at different times, uh, reciting mantras, these short, uh, powerful uh, aphorisms or syllables, also sometimes reciting full verses from Sanskrit texts. Uh, but it's a very elaborate process that must be done very precisely uh, and very ordered. And so this process is to sort of create order out of chaos because the, the temple itself is seen to be a microcosm of the larger cosmos. And so by doing these rituals, uh, the ritual pr professional or the practitioner, uh, usually a priest or a, a pujari, someone who does puja, uh, they, they do these things and it sort of creates order within the world. So pujas like this must be done in order uh, to maintain the order of the cosmos. But uh, of course, these are varying degrees. So pujas can also be done at home and they, they aren't really as uh, intricate. They could be something as simple as lighting incense, lighting a lamp, uh, saying a, a few words, praying, meditating. So puja can take a lot of different forms sort of at its different levels of, um, of difficulty, depending on, often on what place it's, it's done in. But puja itself is um, an interesting type of ritual because again, it's about interacting between interaction between the devotee and the divine in which the uh, devotee and the divine are there at the same place. And so they've, they've shared this exchange through sight. And, but really it's about, just like the temple, about all the sensory experiences. And so the devotee will light incense and offer flowers for the, the smell. Uh, they'll wave lamps for sight. Uh, they'll ring bells for hearing. They'll offer food for taste. Uh, they'll put kum kum and drop flowers on the deities for touch. So all the, the physical sensory experiences are being um, heightened and being offered in this moment. So again, it's about the physicality of actually being in that space uh, and sharing something with the divine. So one of the most ubiquitous forms of puja practice, whether it's in the temple or in the home, is called arati, which could be translated as like a, a lamp or a light. And so this is the moment to where the devotee lights something in front of the deity. Of course, within a lot of religious traditions, the idea of light is something that's important because it gives us light and it's how we see. There's always this contrast between light and darkness. And so arati is this moment to where the light is offered, but more pragmatically, uh, especially in sort of classical or medieval Hinduism, uh, temples didn't have electric lights. And so whenever Arati was done and the lamp was offered to the face of the Murti or the, uh, the image, this is when people actually could see the faces of the deity. So it was extremely important. So if you go to a, a Hindu temple today, 
this is one of the few times where everyone sort of stops what they're doing and focuses in. And so at the moment of Arati, uh, especially in the temple that I study, which is Chamundeshwari in the city of Mysore, all the bells start ringing. And so everything starts going and everyone knows to focus their attention on the deity and it lights up their face and you're able to see. And so this, this lighting of the face then is not just for the deity, because again, it's about interaction. And so the light goes from the deity and then it's taken to the devotee uh, on a tray or, or some sort of plate, and the devotee is able to place their hands over it, feel the same uh, heat from the, from the lamp uh, as the devotee, and then they're able to they're take that and wash it over themselves, partaking in the same light and warmth that the devotee just experienced. And this experiencing of what the devotee or the deity has already experienced is another important concept within uh, Hindu lived practice, which is uh, the practice of receiving prasad. The prasad is uh, the practice of receiving something that has already been consumed by the, the deity. So if you, when you walk in for your darshan, if you're going into temple, typically you'll have a plate of offerings that could be coconut, banana, flowers, clothing, a lot of different things for the deity. But you give it to the, to the pujari, who then goes and offers it uh, in front of the, uh, the murti or the image of the deity. And so this is, at that point, ritually or spiritually consumed by the, by the deity. Uh, they enjoy the coconut, the banana, the sort of essence of it. Uh, and then this is brought back to the, to the devotee, just like the arti. And then they're able to actually consume all of those things. The, the, the process of this is uh, you know, actually is pretty similar to some of the things we experience in, in life. Most of us won't eat after just about anyone, but it has to be a really like um, intimate relationship because you know, you're sharing saliva and things uh, like that. So it's actually a pretty similar concept within Hinduism that uh, you typically don't take things that someone else has already consumed because of all sorts of rules of, of pollution. But in this case, the deity is so much higher and so much more powerful that it's actually good to receive their leftovers and their, their small leavings. So the devotee can actually uh, get the sort of spiritual power, the blessings of that from the deity uh, by taking, consuming a banana that's already been, uh, the essence has already been consumed by the, by the deity. So hopefully this will help uh, you understand a little bit more about how uh, Hindus go about practicing uh, their religion and how they interact or at least see the interaction happening between the devotee and the divine.